Hi, and welcome to the first in a series of videos on reference architectures and best practices for building scalable applications in the cloud. My name is Brian Adler. I'm an architect in the professional services organization here at RightScale. In this role, I've had the opportunity to work with numerous customers spanning various industries. Our professional service customer engagements have ranged from the two guys in a garage scenario all the way up through large enterprise corporations running over 10,000 servers in the cloud. With this experience, we have been exposed to a wide array of applications and use cases and have had the opportunity to collect many best practices, tips, and tricks for creating successful scalable applications in the cloud. In this first video, I'll talk a bit about what a scalable application really is, what all the moving parts are, and why the cloud-based resource model is such an excellent fit for it. Uh, we will introduce a reference architecture that many of our customers have used as it will be presented here, and other customers have used as a base or a template and have modified it to meet their particular and unique application needs. Uh, future videos in this series will discuss each of the tiers of this reference architecture and talk about individual best practices that can be employed at each of these tiers for building robustness and reliability into your scalable web applications. Now before I delve into the details, I'd like to set the stage a bit and talk a little bit about the what's and why's of a scalable web application. Now for our purposes of our discussion, we're going to use a definition such as you see here for a scalable web app. And that is, it's an application built on an architecture that can adapt to changing conditions. Now the important point to note here is that both the architecture and the application need to be dynamic. You can have the greatest architecture in place, but if your application is not coded to take advantage of it, then it will not be able to scale. Now why a scalable web app? Well the reasons are numerous, but probably first and foremost is that traffic and load patterns can be unpredictable. Anybody who's ever been in an environment where a, a viral or a flash mob event occurred knows you can have an order of magnitude increase in traffic in a very short period of time. And as such, you want your application to be able to scale to handle these very dynamic and variable conditions. Availability and reliability. You want your application to be distributed such that your end users can get to it when they want to get to it. Now in the traditional hardware model, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute, is that uh, there's sort of two main ways of handling this in the past. It's been to over-provision and to under-provision. And over-provision is where you threw enough resources at it to handle that viral or flash mob event case. Uh, but in the typical or normal steady state environment, you had a lot of underutilized resources and therefore you had a lot of wasted dollars. Or you could have under-provisioned, and that's where you had just enough infrastructure in place to handle that normal case, but if you did have a viral or flash mob event, your users would typically have a poor uh, end user experience, they were not able to access your site, and therefore you had some lost revenue opportunities. Now what we often say here at RightScale is, don't be a victim of your own success or don't have a success disaster. Don't have things go so well that they go poorly. Now what this graph here shows is sort of the traditional hardware model that we just discussed and it also has a, a sort of an, a, an illustration, if you will, of both the under-provision and the uh, over-provisioning cases which we'll talk about here. Now first you see the orange line and that orange line is sort of the predicted demand and as anyone who's been involved in any of these environments can tell you, trying to predict demand where there's end users accessing your site uh, anytime they want, that can be very, very challenging. Um, what you then see as the, uh, the blue line here the blue line is the infrastructure cost, or you can think of that essentially as the number of servers. And typically that has a, a stair-step function as you see here. You have some infrastructure in place, you throw some additional infrastructure at it, you, so you, you bump it up. You have steady state for a little while, you throw some additional infrastructure at it, you have another steady state, etc. And what we have here shown as the, as the red line, and this is the actual demand. And as you can see, it uh, doesn't really mimic the predicted demand and it rarely even crosses it, right? So what we end out with is uh, two cases. The first one, as shown here with this green arrow, shows a huge disparity between the actual demand, the red line, and the infrastructure in place able to handle that user traffic, shown by the blue line. And as such, there's a lot of underutilized resources here, and therefore a lot of wasted dollars. Now the other thing that can happen, is shown by the shaded region of the graph here, is where you have the actual demand exceeds the capacity of the infrastructure you have in place. And this is where end users are not able to get your, to your site and you have those lost revenue opportunities. Now typically in the traditional hardware model, it's been a game of trying to throw the amount of infrastructure in place that can meet the demand while not having these huge underutilized uh, periods of time along the timeline. Now along comes the scalable cloud model. And what you see here is the exact same predicted demand and the exact same actual demand. But as a result of these green dots here, these are the automated trigger actions which allow the environment to automatically and dynamically scale and to add resources, add infrastructure, add servers to ac in, uh, accommodate this increased load. 
And since we're able to do this automatically, you're able to keep your uh, infrastructure ahead of, if you will, your actual demand curve. And as such, you'll never see a case here where the actual demand exceeds the capacity of the infrastructure, nor will you see a case where there's a huge amount of underutilized resources. Now one thing that's not shown on this graph, but it works in the same basic concept, is a scale down event. And that is if demand decreases, the infrastructure, these servers are shut down, and therefore you save on infrastructure costs. So you do not have a huge disparity, again, between resources and your actual demand. Now the remainder of the, the uh, discussion today in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about a reference architecture and some of the best practices at each of the levels of the, uh, the tiers of that re uh, reference architecture. And the ultimate goal is essentially to implement what you see here shown in this graph. What you see here is a reference architecture that many of our customers have used in bringing their scalable applications into the cloud. Now it may look familiar to many of you that have done scalable application development either in the cloud or even in a data center, but there are a few idiosyncrasies and sort of tips and tricks that we're going to talk about at each of the tiers of this particular architecture. And just to sort of give a quick summary of it, because we'll be referring to this in future videos of the series. You have your standard uh, situation with DNS is pointing your users to your website. You have your load balancing tier handling the distribution of traffic either in a round robin or a least connection based or whatever algorithm that you choose. Behind that we have the application server tier. And what we've drawn here is we have two persistent application servers. But in the yellow box we have the, the true scalable part of the scalable application which is the server array. And we'll talk about in another video of the series all the tips and tricks on how to expand and contract that particular aspect of your architecture to adjust to the conditions and, and the dynamic conditions that you see as far as traffic is concerned on your site. The next video we'll talk about the caching server tier and we'll talk a little bit about how to alleviate the load if you will in a database and to improve the responsiveness of your overall application. Uh, then we'll do a video on the database tier. And what we've drawn here is a master and slave configuration which is our standard configuration but we will talk about how to vertically and horizontally scale uh, this particular tier as well. Um, lastly you see in this architecture you see uh, S3 and that is whatever your cloud of choice's particular flavor of persistent redundant storage might be. And that's where all of your database snapshots go so you can have backup and restore capabilities. Okay, as I mentioned future videos in this series will delve more deeply into each of these tiers. Right? So we will, the next video we do we'll talk extensively about the load balancing tier followed by a, uh, a video on the application server tier with particular focus paid to the uh, scalable aspect of it. We'll have another video on the caching tier. We'll then have a video on the database tier, which as I said, we'll talk about the vertical and horizontal scaling capabilities of your database tier. And then the final video of the series will summarize these best practices and teach you guys the next steps for bringing your applications into the scalable world. Um, I hope you found this first introductory video uh, useful and hopefully it will entice you to watch the remaining videos of the series on building scalable applications in the cloud. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time.